On the hunt for a funky city car that's fun to drive, cheap to run, and has a rather bold design. Well, meet the Toyota iGo. And in today's review, we'll find out together if truly great things come from such a small package. Yeah, yeah. The Toyota iGo was one of the very first compact city cars to arrive in the UK when it made its debut way back in 2005. Since then, over 760,000 units have rolled off the manufacturer's production line in the Czech Republic alongside its Citroen and Peugeot siblings. To set it apart, Toyota designed the iGo to showcase the brand's more playful side with its focus on distinctive design, low running costs and a fun city driving experience. It aims not only to appeal to Toyota's typical customer base, but also to younger drivers looking for their first vehicle, something that's affordable to fill up and ensure. This is the refreshed version of the second generation model that's been in production since 2018. So how does it stack up nearly four years later? Is it still a strong offering in the city car segment or does it really need another facelift? Well, the iGo is kept on its toes by tough competition. Firstly, we have this car's direct siblings, the Citroen C1 and Peugeot 108, both very popular variants in the European market. Then there's the Korean rivals, the smart Hyundai i10 and the absolutely gorgeous Kia Picanto. And then we have the comfortable Skoda Citigo and the Volkswagen Up, both of which offer a sophisticated take on this compact form factor. So is this refreshed version of the second generation iGo your perfect next car? In this in-depth review, we're gonna help you decide exactly that by exploring the exterior and interior design, how much stuff you can fit inside that boot, the technology and safety features on offer, the driving experience, pricing, and trim levels. We'll start then with the exterior design by taking a look at that striking front end. To me, this is the most appealing aspect of the exterior, but let me know what you make of it in the comments below. I just absolutely love this X shape and the 3D effect that's going on here. How the headlights just merge around the sides and nearly collide into that Toyota badging displayed really prominently in the center there. It's a really bold look, and in my opinion, it's the best looking city car on the market at the moment. The headlights then, unfortunately, they're not LED, they're just halogen. Uh, the daytime running lights are LED though, and if you opt for the X trend or exclusive trim levels, they are the highest spec variants, then you get front fog lamps down here. I've got the entry level X play variant with me today, so I don't have fog lamps. Um, in their place, I've just got a plastic cap, which I could probably pry out if I wanted to. Let's take a look at this color then, because it really makes the exterior come alive. This is red pop and it's a solid paint and it comes as standard, so you don't have to pay anything extra when you configure this car. You can pay 250 quid to get pure white, if white is more your thing, or pay 560 pounds for a range of metallic colors. Uh, these include silver splash, bold black, and decima gray, all of which look fantastic with this car. Opt for the higher spec trim levels, the X Trend and the Exclusive, and you can choose between a number of different two-tone exterior paint options. So you can have a white or blue body color with a black roof, or black body color with a red roof. Loads of different options here, guys. If you'd like to explore those a little bit more closely, then click that pop-out banner above to contact our vehicle specialists. There's nothing too extravagant going on with this side profile, but let's take a look at these wheels to start off with. These are 15 inch steel wheels. That's what you get as standard with the X-Play trim level. Uh, the design is nothing to write home about. Unfortunately, scuffs show up quite easily on them. If you want alloys, you need to go with those high spec trim levels and 15 inches is all you can have size wise, unfortunately. The door mirrors are heated as standard, which is great to see, especially on those cold winter days like today. And they're being whatever body color you've chosen as well, as will the door handles. And if we go over here slightly, we can check out the rear privacy glass on the passenger door. If we open that up, you can pry it open slightly to let a bit of a draft in to the cabin on those hot and toasty summer days. And here's the fuel cap. So to get that open, there's a lever on the right hand side of the driver. Just pop it once and it will fly open for you. 
Aside from a few tweaks here and there, the Igo's dimensions have remained pretty much the same since that first generation model. Um, it's nearly identical in size to the Citroen C1 and Peugeot 1 and 8, so if you like the compact nature of those vehicles, then you'll love what's in store here. As you can see then, it's a really tiny car, so it measures just 1,650 millimeters wide, though this is slightly wider than the Kia Picanto, though it's not as long or high as that car. So it's 3,465 millimeters across and 1,460 millimeters up. What about that rear end then? Well, it's just as striking as the front end. I just love the design of these rear lights and this bit here that just struts out. It's really, really prominent. Love this glass boot lid. It's really, really reflective. Gives it a nice look. Um, and I really like the design of the rear bumper. I've seen that in that black. It really nicely complements the red body color that we've chosen. So yeah, it's not too overcomplicated, but it's really effective. Let me know what you make of it though in the comments. So you're probably wondering at this point, how much stuff can I fit in the back of the iGo? Is it gonna be enough room for my shopping bags, maybe even a bike or some luggage? Let's find out then. To open it up, just press that in, it will unlatch for you and you can fling it open. So you're rewarded with 168 litres up to the tonneau cover. If you take that out, you get 198 litres up to the roof lining. And yes, this is disappointing even by city car standards, unfortunately. Uh, by comparison, the Volkswagen Up offers 251 litres and the Kia Picanto gives you 255 litres. Uh, this is just enough room for two small suitcases around this size. And I have to put this one on its side even to fit it in so yeah it's not great though if you're somebody who makes multiple trips to the shop every week as opposed to doing one big shop then this might just work for you. You may have also noticed that it has a rather tall loading lip which can make it quite difficult to load heavy shopping bags into the back unfortunately. Um, the boot floor goes down quite deep and it's not height adjustable so you'll find yourself lifting bags up to get over that lip and placing them quite far down into the boot and that could put quite a bit of strain on your arms. Um, there's a lack of any kind of bits and bobs. There's just a hook there and a hook there to attach objects that like to fly around. But there's no hooks on the floor itself, which is disappointing to see. In order to maximize luggage capacity, you need to fold down the rear seats in that 50-50 arrangement, and that's really easy to do. You just tug on those straps, the seats will unlatch for you, and you can push them down like so. There we go. So when they're folded completely flat, there's unfortunately a rather large step in the floor and that can make it quite awkward to load in longer items that you might be able to fit in a small adult bike if you take off one of the wheels. So that's great to see. If you need a little bit more extra space, perhaps you've got a rear passenger to fit in the back as well, you can fold one of the seats back up and that will allow you to slide some luggage across on top of that other rear seat. So overall then the boot space, disappointing compared to its other city car rivals, though I think Toyota has done nearly as much as it can to maximize the practicality on offer here. So guys, if you're loving the iGo so far, you're a massive fan of that exterior design, and you reckon this boot space is all you need, then make sure to get in touch with OSV's vehicle specialists to secure yours. And you can do so by calling 01903 538 835 alternatively just click the pop-up banner up there to book a date or time that works for you for a chat with one of our team okay i think it's time i go behind the wheel of the i go car is designed for city driving and as such it just absolutely excels at it. The uh, 1 litre 72 horsepower engine under the bonnet here does a great job at giving you enough oomph for pottering around town to the local shops, though it does struggle a little bit to keep up to speed with fast moving traffic. The uh, 5 speed manual gearbox is quite nippy, um, it speeds up to around 30 miles per hour, though anything faster than that you will find yourself revving quite hard. Um, in order to sort of keep up with that motorway traffic, 
and get up those steep inclines. So the Igo is a really comfortable city car to drive around town. Uh, we're maneuvering around a roundabout. You don't really jostle around too much and that's thanks to these side cushions here that nicely hold you in place. And generally speaking, motory, uh, motorway driving is pretty calm. Though I will say when you drive over a pothole or a slight imperfection in the road, like a crack in the road, something like that, you will feel the impact of this reverberate uh, throughout the cabin. It's not great at handling these kinds of surfaces. So the steering is quite light but it feels responsive at the same time. It's actually 14% sharper um, than the previous model which is great to see. Um, this means it's really easy to nip into tight spaces in our traffic and carefully navigate into a tight parking space as well. I think you'll really enjoy the steering. It's not as hard as you'll find in its rivals and it's not too light as well so it doesn't lack any kind of feel with the front wheels it's that nice balance so the eye go grips really nicely especially around corners and that's thanks to the really tight turning circle of 10.2 meters you'll find out here as we just turn into this uh into this junction here really smooth kind of effortless for this car to be honest so a note on wind and road noise then, um, taking on feedback from Toyota customers about the previous gen model, uh, Toyota's engineers uh, wanted to improve wind and road insulation in order for the engine to be heard a little bit more clearly because customers really love the sound of that three cylinder engine and it's not hard to see why, it's a definite selling point of the iGo. So what is, so how um, has road and wind noise been improved then? Well it's pretty good to be fair. Um, driving at high speeds, hardly notice any road noise seeping into the cabin. Now you do get a little bit of wind noise um, coming from the uh, front window, can whistle at times on a particularly windy day which is a little bit distracting but if you put the radio on, something like that, just to drown that sound out then you shouldn't have to worry about it at all. The Igo offers fantastic visibility. I've got a great view of the road ahead of me and that's thanks to the rather lofty driving position. Uh, the rather thin side pillars here and the reasonably large door mirrors gives you a great view of your blind spot and what's around you. The view at the back, while not as great as a VW Up, is not bad. I can see reasonable about uh, amount of the road behind me. Um, you get a reversing camera as standard across all trim levels, though you do have to configure rear parking sensors as an optional extra, it's a little bit disappointing, but it is nice to pop that camera on when you're reversing out of a tight space and it gives you that extra bit of security. I'll just talk about safety for a little bit then. So as standard you get lane at departure warning. This alerts you when you start to exit your own lane. Um, it'll just alert you of that and put you back on the straight and narrow. You also get automatic emergency braking. So if you incorrectly judge the gap between the, you and the car in front of you, it will brake to prevent any kind of rear end collision there. And these just hope, help to improve overall safety. Um, the iGo has been awarded four stars by Euro NK for overall safety um, which is pretty good I mean a lot of cars these days that are coming out are getting five stars because they're absolutely loaded with safety tech um, but compared to some of its rivals the Igo does fall short in overall passenger safety so that is something to, to uh, take into account there and that's likely because it just lacks some of the other safety features that its rivals now have Okay guys, let's head back to our car park. You've probably seen the infotainment screen uh, flash up a few times in this shot, so let's explore the interior a little bit more closely. It's time to talk about the interior then. So the material quality on offer isn't as high as you would find in a sophisticated offering like the Hyundai i10, for example. There's a fair amount of cheap plastics dotted around the place here. But having said that, the build quality is really, really solid. Um, it doesn't feel flimsy. The plastics are nicely held in place. And there's a decent amount of material variety as well. You've got some nice uh, gloss black surrounds on the side vents here and surrounding the infotainment screen there. Nice bit of stainless steel on the uh, gear lever and a bit of the exterior body colour seeps into the cabin on the doors there. Really, really nice touch. So it's nothing extravagant, nothing over the top and I think it's all you need it to be really. It does the job. I'm really impressed with the seats as well. So these are upholstered in dark grey fabric with a light grey and white 
bolsters and I think the standard seats they look really really nice if you opt for the top spec exclusive trim you get uh, black part leather seats and they look great as well so you can't really go wrong with the seats They're very very comfortable um, there's a nice bit of support thanks to these side cushions here which is great especially when going around corners and as you found out a little bit earlier this car's main issue really is with body lean so they nicely hold you in place while navigating around those so that's great to see um, there's no lumbar support though unfortunately which is a little bit of a shame even on those high spec trim levels uh, adjustability is fine it's really easy to find a comfortable driving position just use the levers on the right hand side to prop yourself up or down you can also take yourself back using the rotary dial on the left hand side requires a little bit of force but yeah it's really easy to fully recline if you need to at a motorway service station or something like that let's turn our attention to the steering wheel then so a standard this will be a three spoke leather wrapped wheel and it feels really nice it's got quite a premium feel to be fair um, you'll find more of that piano black uh, gloss material used um, on the left hand side there's controls for the media and on the right you can either answer all reject calls depending on who it is and there's a setting there to play around with the lane departure warning safety feature just behind the wheel we've got a really interesting and funky looking cluster for uh, the driver display and it shows all the information right where you need it there's a tiny little screen in the middle there in uh, just in the center of the speedometer and that shows basic info like the temperature how much fuel you've got left in the tank and how many miles you've covered so far the speedometer is massive it's really easy to see how fast you're going which is obviously very helpful on the left hand side you've got a rev counter on the right it actually shows you when you should shift so you can maximize fuel efficiency as much as possible so yeah it's great to have all this key information right where you need it right in front of you and i appreciate that toyota has actually thought about the design here it's not just one block you know massive touch screen or whatever that distracts you while on the go it's really interestingly thought out and yeah adds a lot of personality to the interior in my opinion let's check out that central display then so this is a seven inch media touch screen i'm just going to boot the car up so i can show you it takes a little bit of time to get going um, it's pretty basic there's no maps or anything on there all you can do is just connect your phone up via bluetooth um, you can also take advantage of apple carplay and android auto though this is a wired connection and you'll plug your phone in uh, using the usb port down there uh, the bluetooth is really really easy it takes about 20 seconds to connect to your phone faster than vehicles that cost three four five times the price as the uh, i go so that's really good to see um, it's very easy to navigate around as well the screen is nice and sharp the options are large enough to see while on the move very very clear and it's responsive as well there's hardly any lag at all let's make our way down the center console then so just below the screen we've got the climate controls and it's great to see that they're all physical buttons so they're really easy to use while on the move they make a rather satisfying click sound as well which is great uh, you can angle the vents towards you, you know, towards your feet, or you can heat up the windscreen. So it's nice to have those different options. Uh, just below that, then we've got the aforementioned USB port uh, for plugging in your phone. Um, there's an AUX port next to that, and there's a 12 volt socket for plugging in a, a laptop or a tablet. Below that, we've got a couple of cup holders. That's a good place to put your keys when you're sitting in the car idly. Um, in front of that is a reasonably sized tray for a smartphone, though a lot of phones these days are much bulkier than the size of this tray, but it'll fit things like sweets and other bits and bobs. We've opted for the five speed manual gearbox. So this is the uh, gear lever here. As I said earlier, I really like the chrome surrounds on it and it's really easy to uh, make gear changes while on the move got the uh, handbrake down there and just behind it you've got another cup holder though you should probably save that for the rear passengers so you don't annoy them too much final bits and bobs for the front here then so the glove box is pretty cavernous you can fit quite a lot of stuff in there perfect for your manuals but if you want to take those out you can fit you know packets of crisps uh, sweets whatever you want in there really the air vents nicely designed simple but effective and the door bins are okay i've got my uh, water bottle just shoved in there at the moment it fits but it's not a comfortable fit it's tight though so it's not going to come out while on the move uh, you just have to wedge it in there and it'll be fine this is a city car after all so i'm hoping you're not expecting suv levels of space in the back but how much space do we actually have to work with well let's hop out and we'll take a look 
As you might have expected, it's pretty cramped in the back here, and I'll tell you why, starting with legroom then. So I can't stretch my legs out all the way, just about halfway, so it's not bad, it's just not great. Um, you'll see then I'm sitting in a rather awkward position where my knees are quite high up, they're nearly touching my chin. That could get a little bit uncomfortable on longer journeys, um, and they are nearly touching the lining of the seat in front of me, uh, though that's not too bad actually because the uh, lining here is pretty soft and squidgy, so that's fine. Uh, the seats themselves are quite spongy, so they're pretty comfortable, which is great to see. What's headroom like then? Well, I'm 5'8", so I've got a little bit of space to work with up here. If I simulate someone who is much taller than I am, let's sit up a little bit. It's like a six foot passenger. You can see that the tufts of my hair are just about touching that roof lining. So again, can be a little bit uncomfortable for those long journeys and adults are certainly gonna feel hemmed in in the back here. If you have small kids, then you can strap them in using the Isofix fittings on either rear seat. And I do need to point out the headrest because I actually really like this. So if you push that down, it will slide all the way down for you. Goes down pretty far, goes all the way actually. And you can just hold it there to slide it all the way up, though it does get caught on the, the roof lining, unfortunately. On this seat, it seems to be fine on the other one. Um, you can't slide down the window fully as such. It's just that latch that um, I, sh I showed you earlier. So there we go, that's what it looks like from the inside. Um, just, you can let some air in on a hot, win hot winter's day, hot summer's day. Try not to trap your fingers in there as you shut the window. And you get a small door bin just down there, it's probably enough room to fit a 250 mil bottle, nothing larger than that. It's not a whole lot of space, but it's nice that there is space in the back for those little bits and bobs. Um, there's also that cup holder down there for the rear passengers to fight over. From the rear space then, which we knew was gonna be cramped because it's a city car, I'm really impressed with what's on offer inside the iGo. If you have any more questions that need answers or you just like a little bit more information, then do make sure to get in touch with OSV's vehicle specialists. They'd be more than happy to help you out with anything that you need. So make sure to get in touch on 01903 538 835 or you can click the pop-up banner. It's just hanging out up there to book a date or time that works for you for a quick chat. Okay, then we're gonna talk about the engine on off and to do so, we need to head around to the front passenger side and just flick that latch. So if you would excuse me, I'm gonna go do that now. And that lever is pretty tricky to find. It's really well hidden. So let's open up that door. You're gonna to have to crouch down and it's right to the left-hand side of the passenger side. There we go. Pull it once and it will unlatch for you. So let's open this up. There's another lever there and we can prop this open like so. So, there's just a single powertrain option with the Ago, and you get that familiar one litre uh, three cylinder VVTi unit. And this is the same one found under the bonnet of its predecessor, though a few refinements have been made uh, to this Mark II model to improve responsiveness, handling and fuel efficiency. This unit can be had in either manual or automatic and we've opted for the former, so we've got five-speed manual here. Uh, this outputs 72 horsepower and 93 newton meters of torque. It achieves a maximum top speed of 99 miles per hour and it can do 0 to 62 in just, well not just, but it can do it in 13.8 seconds and that's four tenths of a second faster than the previous previous gen model. Um, as you found out in the driving experience section then, it's really nippy at getting quickly off the block and slipping into tight gaps in the traffic, though you will find yourself sluggishly building speed on a motorway, you know, trying to merge onto a motorway. So that is something to take into account. The iGo is fairly fuel efficient. So Toyota claims from 53.3 to 57.6 miles per gallon. This is optimistic, but achievable. Uh, ultimately, it depends on the kind of driving that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're somebody who travels to work uh, you live in the city and you rarely go above 30 miles per hour, then you could achieve that uh, top range miles per gallon figure. Um, also, if you shift when the car tells you to shift on the dash, then you could get close to that figure as well. So yeah, ultimately it depends on the kind of driving you do. CO2 emissions are pretty good too. So the iGo outputs around 114 grams per kilometer of CO2 on the combined cycle. Though as I explained earlier, there's only one engine offered. So the iGo currently isn't available as a hybrid or electric car, which is unfortunate. It means you kind of take advantage of one of the lower 
company car tax bans, but yeah, as it stands, not bad. Thinking about opting for automatic, well, thanks to the slightly shorter gear ratios, it's actually better than the manual transmission at building up speed around town. Uh, performance stats are pretty much identical to manual, though it does take a little bit longer to get for 0 to 62. Expect around 15.1 seconds, not bad, but a little bit longer. The automatic transmission is slightly less fuel efficient than manual. Uh, Toyota claims from 51.3 to 54.3 miles per gallon, and it emits slightly more CO2 at around 119 grams per kilometer. Um, and to be honest, I would encourage you to weigh up whether you need automatic. Of course, if you just prefer it over manual, because it's easier, then that's fair enough. But because this is a city car and it's really easy to do those gear changes um, in manual anyway, um, I would just, I would consider uh, getting that manual transmission. It is really fun. And of course you do benefit from, from better fuel efficiency and lower CO2 over automatic. That's it for the engines, guys. If you have any further questions, then get in touch with OSV's vehicle specialist. They'd be happy to answer any of your questions to help you make that all important purchasing decision. Right, how much is the iGo? And which trim level should you opt for? The Toyota iGo starts from £13,920 with the entry level X-Play model and that's what we showcased in this review today. And it's all that most buyers will really need. It comes with a really generous amount of standard equipment including those 15 inch steel wheels, heated door mirrors, electric front windows, smartphone integration with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, Bluetooth and DAB radio and those things are integrated with that 7 inch media touchscreen that comes to standard regardless of which trim level you go for. So if you're somebody who doesn't need all of the bells and whistles out of the next vehicle then this is a fantastic option. Next up the ladder is the mid-range X-Trem trim and that starts from £15,085. There's a few upgrades over that entry level model. Uh, these include the 10 inch black machined alloy wheels which are 10 spoke look really really nice. There's a bit more privacy glass as well. You get automatic headlights and this is where you can take advantage of the two-tone color schemes to really personalize the Argo to your needs. So if you're somebody who wants to really customize this car then this is the trim for you. The top spec exclusive trim starts from £16,270 and climbs up to £17,000 when configured with the X-Shift automatic transmission. And with this, you get the 15-inch uh, black machined alloys, though these are now double spoke, look really, really nice. You get those customization options as you do with the X-Trend trims and you get a few extra bits as well. So you get smart, entry, uh, push the start button and automatic air conditioning. So if you're somebody who wants to maximize the iGo as much as possible, get the most out of it, then this is a trim level that you go for. So guys, should you buy, lease or finance a Toyota iGo? Well, I've had such fun with this car over the past week and it's a really exciting city car. You'll enjoy a bold exterior design that stands out on UK roads, a fun manual transmission that's really easy to use while on the go, decent infotainment inside the cabin, really impressive considering how affordable this vehicle is. Speaking of affordability, it's a good choice for a company car, especially if you live in the city. It's very frugal as well. You can take advantage of some great fuel efficiency. And it's a great choice for a young driver as well, just looking for their first vehicle. What are some of the downsides then? While this small form factor means it's a really easy car to park and drive around town, this unfortunately comes at the cost of practicality. The boot space, well, as you saw earlier, isn't great. It's rather restrictive, as is the rear passenger space. Um, also, it's a little bit unfortunate that there's no hybrid or electric option at this time. I hoped uh, Toyota would introduce this uh, with a third generation model. However, it seems that the iGo is being pushed out in favor of the upcoming iGo X small SUV, which looks fantastic. Really can't wait to give you coverage on that, guys. It looks like a really promising car. Though, it seems to have the same one liter three cylinder engine under the bonnet. So, hybrid and electric options still very much up in the air. Also, the iGo just lacks refinement at speed, so this is a car very much made for cruising around town, around 30 miles per hour, and if this is what you're looking for, you want a car to cruise around in comfort and style, then you'll absolutely love 
what's on offer. So guys, I really hope you enjoyed this in-depth review of the Toyota iGo. As you can tell from my enthusiasm, it's still a fantastic offering in the city car segment, four years on from that facelift. If you enjoyed the video, then give it a thumbs up. That really helps the channel out. Also make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the latest motoring content. And once you are subscribed, once you're part of the OSV community, then make sure to click the notification bell to get notified when a new video goes live. But that's very much it for today, guys. I'm gonna head back into the office to warm up. It's very, very cold today, but I'll see you next time. In the meantime, guys, take care and safe driving.